So we are moving on to chapter 19, and the reason that we're skipping from chapter 5 uh, directly to chapter 19 is because chapter 19 has to do with chemical thermodynamics, which is related to what we've been doing in chapter 5 uh, with thermochemistry. And in fact, we learned in chapter 5 the first law of thermodynamics, which is that energy cannot be uh, created or destroyed. So what do we mean when we're talking about chemical thermodynamics? Well, it's really concerned with just a couple of things. Uh, chemical thermodynamics is really the answers the question or tries to answer the question of whether or not a given reaction is going to occur and if that reaction is going to occur, uh, to what extent will that reaction or process occur? And so that second bullet point, which has to do with equilibrium, we're going to tackle later in the year. And so what we're going to talk about in chapter 19 right now has to do with answering this first question of whether or not a given reaction will occur. And so that is associated with the concept of spontaneity. And we've talked about spontaneity a little bit previously in chapter four when it came to um, the question of, of the activity series of metals and, and which direction a reaction would be spontaneous in. But let's just define a spontaneous process. A spontaneous process is gonna be one that will occur without any outside intervention. And so here is a physical example of this. I've got a gas uh, in this flask and the stopcock is closed and this flask is evacuated. If I open the stopcock, then gas is essentially gonna rush from flask A into flask B until they're equilibrated. That is a spontaneous process. I open the stopcock um, and it happens. The reverse process is not spontaneous. That is, uh, it. The, the system is not going to spontaneously suddenly decide to organize all the gas back into flask A. And so just reversing the conditions, which would be you know, closing the stopcock again, will not uh, cause the reverse reaction to occur. Um, so what's important to uh, note about spontaneous processes, and again, we talked about this a little bit uh, when we were talking about the activity series, is that if a process, or again, what's, what's concerning us is chemical reactions. If a reaction is spontaneous in one direction, then it's not gonna be spontaneous in the other. And so we can take a real simple example of dropping eggs and seeing them smash on a table. The forward process here is spontaneous. Uh, the reverse process is not spontaneous. Okay, what about chemical processes? We've talked about gases going from one flask to another. We've talked about um, eggs falling. What about chemical processes? When we talk about a reaction being spontaneous, we're really asking the question, will it occur as written? In other words, in the direction in which it's written. And so this reaction, uh, which, you, which was the sort of reaction that was on your last test, as to whether or not it would be spontaneous. This is a redox reaction that is spontaneous because zinc is higher up the activity series than silver is. So this is a spontaneous reaction. If I turn that around and write it in the reverse direction, that is instead of silver oxidizing zinc, which is spontaneous, um, I ask zinc to oxidize silver, that is non-spontaneous. So if I put a piece of zinc into a solution of silver nitrate, uh, the silver will start to plate out and the zinc will start to go into solution. But if I put a piece of silver into a solution of zinc nitrate, then, then nothing will happen. A process that is spontaneous in one direction is not spontaneous in the other direction. And so just some terminology we want to make sure that we're familiar with. When we say a chemical reaction is spontaneous, what we mean is that the forward reaction will occur as written. And so that's what we're trying to demonstrate here. The forward reaction will occur as written. Here, the forward reaction will not occur as written. The reverse reaction would occur, but the forward reaction will not occur. Another term that you will see used for spontaneous in chemical systems is thermodynamically favorable. And that simply means the same thing. If a thing is thermodynamically favorable, then the forward reaction will occur as written uh, without any outside intervention. 
Well, what is going to cause a chemical process to be spontaneous? That's the real thing that we want to, that's what the point of this chapter is in the end, is whether we can look at a forward reaction, look at tabulated data, and see if we can determine whether a reaction is spontaneous. So is there some simple way to predict whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous? One thing that may easily come to mind is the idea of, well, how about the fact that if a reaction is exothermic, that makes it spontaneous. Does that work? So let's check and see. Um, well, here's a, a, here's a reaction that we're familiar with, combustion. This is the combustion of methane. Combustion of methane is a spontaneous process. Uh, in other words, if you put a match to this, it'll start and then it'll just continue on its own without any outside intervention. Um, and this is true of all combustion reactions. They are all spontaneous and they're all exothermic. So that's looking good. Um, here's the lab experiment we've been doing or are about to do, and we've seen demonstrations of this before. Uh, any neutralization reaction of an acid with a hydroxide base is exothermic, and they're all spontaneous. Um, here's one uh, that I think I've described in class before. It's not actually a chemical reaction, but it's taking sulfuric acid and dissolving it in water. That is entirely spontaneous. Uh, sulfuric acid and water are soluble in each other in all combinations, and it is very exothermic. So there's another example of exothermic meaning spontaneous. And here's the reaction that actually occurs in, a, in an alkaline battery, just a non-rechargeable regular alkaline battery that you, bought, that you buy at the store. This is exothermic, it's spontaneous, and pretty much any electrochemical reaction that we use uh, to power a battery is going to be exothermic. Um, and you, batteries get warm when they operate, and they're all spontaneous. So that's looking good. And so most exothermic reactions are spontaneous, and the vice versa is also true. Most spontaneous reactions are exothermic. However, it's not always the case that exothermic processes are spontaneous or vice versa. And so another thing that we have seen that is endothermic and very spontaneous is dissolving ammonium nitrate in water. You can dissolve a lot of ammonium nitrate in water. It's a totally spontaneous process. You put an ammonium nitrate into water, it dissolves very easily. Uh, but that's also endothermic, and you can see that the value of delta H for this reaction is positive. And so that is a so that goes against that idea of everything that is spontaneous being exothermic and vice versa. Um, and so this is what drives these cold packs that uh, you just break the snap the thing and you're dissolving ammonium nitrate in water and you get your instant cold. Here's another thing. There are some reactions. So, for example, freezing water is exothermic because you have to remove heat from the system in order to get it to occur. Is it spontaneous? Well, it depends on the temperature. Freezing water is exothermic and it is spontaneous, but only below zero degrees Celsius above zero degrees Celsius, it's not spontaneous. And so we have some of these counterexamples of number one, endothermic processes that are spontaneous in some cases, and exothermic processes that might be spontaneous at one temperature, but not spontaneous at another. So there's got to be some other criterion uh, for, for spontaneity. And so this leads us to one of the major topics in chapter 19, which is entropy. And I suspect you've probably heard of entropy just in sort of popular culture, just in colloquial terms, not in any rigorous, well-defined way, but entropy simply, which by the way, has the symbol S, capital S. We can think of it as a measure of the randomness or disorder of a system. And we kind of all know that things that things don't naturally tend toward order. They tend toward randomness or disorder. Uh, if you have a nice straightened up room uh, and you make no further attempt to keep it straightened up, it's just going to naturally get messy. Uh, the entropy of a, if the entropy at the molecular level is related to the various modes of motion of molecules, and, and we'll talk in just a second about what, what we mean by that. And then these various modes of motion are known, are what are known as microstates. 
and and the units of entropy are joules per kelvin and so that's a lot to kind of try to digest on one slide and so let me try and flesh that out a little bit for you. first let's talk about movement in microstates if we think about a molecule there are a lot of different ways in which it can move uh, it can vibrate in which these uh, bonds are sort of changing uh, their lengths a little bit so this one's getting shorter, this one's getting longer, or maybe they're both getting shorter or longer at the same time, or maybe their bond angle is just vibrating a little bit. A molecule can rotate. It can rotate on an, on basically what's a vertical axis here. It can rotate on any axis, and it can move. It can move from this side of the slide to that side of the slide. That's called the translational movement. So a microstate is a is basically a snapshot in time of taking a whole system and looking at the motion of all molecules in that system. And the more microstates that are available to a system, the higher the entropy. Well, let me try and kind of break that down for you just a little bit more um, it with a fairly simple kind of um, sort of simplified example let's take a system here with two flasks and and only two gas molecules in it if we have a two flask system and only two gas molecules we can define a microstate as simply being which uh, what combination of flasks are the two um, are the two gas molecules in and there are four possible microstates available here if if we can have blue on the left red on the right, red on the left, blue on the right, blue and red on the left, blue and red on the right. There are four microstates there. And in fact, it's just gonna be a two to the N for N number of, of molecules. And in fact, if we double the number of molecules, go from two molecules to four, we actually square the number of microstates because it's two to the N. So two to the fourth, is now 16 different microstates. So what you can see, so what this is showing you is just a general concept of what we mean by microstates, but also the fact that they increase exponentially as you increase the number of particles. So when I had two particles, I had four microstates. Uh, when I've got four particles, I've got 16 microstates. If I had uh, six particles, I would have 64 microstates, and it just keeps going up exponentially. Well, let's talk about that in terms of a chemical system. Let's talk about a collection of particles and try and think about what are some of the things that are going to increase the entropy of a system. So in part from actually performing a chemical reaction and changing this thing into that thing, what sorts of things are gonna to tend to increase the number of microstates of a system and therefore the entropy of a system? Well, one thing would be heating. So if I have, whether it's a solid or a liquid or a gas, the hotter it is, the higher the temperature it is, the more uh, faster those molecules are moving or vibrating or rotating, the more microstates are available and therefore the higher the entropy. Um, a phase change is, can increase the entropy of a system. A liquid has a lot more available microstates than a solid because a so, in a solid, all the particles are held in place, and so their only available microstates are vibrational. In a liquid, now they have the ability to move past each other, um, and so they've got a lot more available microstates. And if we change that again to a gas, now those particles are totally independent of each other, they've got much, much more, not only range of rotation and vibration, but also translational uh, microstates available to them. And so the entropy is gonna go up again if we go from solid to liquid to gas. Mixing things increases the entropy. If I've got a, if instead of a flask full of gas and another one evacuated, I've got one flask full of nitrogen and another flask full of oxygen, they're eventually going to diffuse through each other and they're going to mix and that tremendously increases the available number of microstates because now it's not just a question of whether they're moving or whether they're vibrating or whether they're rotating. It also has to do with whether or not the particle is a nitrogen molecule or an oxygen molecule. So that is exponentially increasing 
the available microstates if we mix things together. Um, increasing the volume, particularly of a gas sample, that allows many more translational microstates. That's going to increase the energy of the system. And then adding more particles. And so one point we want to make that entropy is a is a is an extensive property. And so as we saw in those things with the two flasks and going from two particles to four particles, adding more particles is going to increase the entropy of the system. And so here's some illustrations of this. Um, it's just, as I was just talking about ice, uh, water in, in a solid form is held in a very rigid way, and so its motion, its microstates are limited to vib only vibration. Um, it, the liquid state water now has vibrate and um, rotational freedom in addition to vibrational freedom, and it can move some. And so that increases the microstates, increases the entropy. And now if we're in the gas state, um, now we have total freedom of translational movement, vibrational movement, and rotational movement. OK, let's talk about react. We've talked about a system in which it, we're not doing a reaction. We're just kind of doing physical things to it and what would increase the entropy. Let's talk about a reaction. What is going to increase the entropy when a reaction occurs? Well, in general, we're going to increase the entropy if we're forming gases from liquids or solids, because we just talked about the fact that gases have a much greater a number of microstates and therefore much higher entropy than liquids and solids. So if a reaction forms a gas from a liquid or a solid, that's going to increase the entropy of the system. Um, if a liquid or a solution is formed from a solid, because liquids and liquid solutions are uh, have more microstates uh, than solids do, that's going to increase the entropy of the system. If I increase the number of gas molecules, that is because, again, entropy is, a, um, is an extensive property. So I have a reaction that increases the number of gas molecules. I'm increasing the number of particles, increasing the entropy. Uh, or if I increase the number of the total number of moles of particles in the system, that's going to tend to increase the entropy. And so here's an example of a reaction in which I go, uh, in which um, nitrogen dioxide decomposes into nitrogen monoxide plus oxygen. So a couple things. I'm increasing the number of gas molecules here because I'm going from two moles of particles to three moles of particles. And I'm just increasing the overall total number of, of moles in the system. Both of those things are going to have the effect of increasing the entropy of the system. Um, solution formation, generally, because that's a form of mixing, is going to increase the entropy of the system. You can see that these sodium and chloride particles now have much greater freedom of motion in the liquid state than they did in the solid state. Now, you will notice, actually, that, it's, that the water is actually becoming a little bit more ordered, because where the water was sort of random here, it's now actually becoming more ordered as it surrounds cations and anions. And so not all solution processes are do lead to an increase in entropy, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But generally, the increase in entropy of the solute uh, tends to overcome the decrease in entropy of the solvent when we have a, a mixing process like this, a solution process like this. Okay, what about entropy associated with heat transfer? Well, when, en when heat is transferred, let's say from a system to the surroundings, the entropy change of the system is equal to the heat transferred by the system divided by its absolute temperature. And conversely, the entropy change of the surroundings is going to be equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the entropy change of the system. So to put that in, in mathematical terms, when heat is transferred from a system to the surroundings, the change in entropy of the system is going to be equal to the heat transferred by the system divided by T. And this makes some sense. If Q is negative, that is, it's exothermic, that means heat is leaving the system. That means the system is losing energy. That means it's losing a microstate. So if this is negative, heat is lost by the system. The entropy of the system, the delta S of the system is going to be negative, and the entropy is going to go down. 
Similarly, let's say, again, I've got an exothermic process in which heat is being lost by the system. So this is going to be, so if heat is being lost by the system, uh, Q is negative, a negative negative gives me a positive, the entropy of the surroundings is going up because heat is being transferred to the surroundings. That is going to add kinetic energy to the surroundings, and it's going to increase the number of microstates of the surroundings, and the entropy of the surroundings is going to go up. Okay, just a few more things about entropy. Uh, like total energy, that is internal energy, E and the enthalpy H, entropy is a state function. Therefore, it doesn't matter what the path is. The change in entropy for a, for a particular process is simply equal to the final state minus the initial state. And as I said before, it's also an extensive property. But we still need to answer the question that we started this whole presentation with, which is what do entropy and entropy changes have to do with spontaneity? Because I brought in the topic of entropy to try and explain uh, spontaneity in reactions. Well, here comes the punchline of this, and I'm just going to I'm just going to tease you with this now, and then we'll talk about it more in the next video. But the second law of thermodynamics says this. Any process that results in an increase in the entropy of the universe is going to be spontaneous. By contrast, any process that results in a decrease in the entropy of the universe will not will be non-spontaneous. So that is our criterion for spontaneity, and that is what is the effect of the process on the entropy of the universe. To put that in mathematical terms, for a spontaneous process, the delta S of the universe, which is equal to the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings. Remember, system plus surroundings equals universe. For a spontaneous process, that's going to be greater than zero. For a non-spontaneous process, uh, that is going to be less than zero. And then for a process at equilibrium, which is another thing that we're not going to talk about uh, much right now, we'll talk about later in the year. Actually, for a process at equilibrium, the delta S of the universe is equal to zero. So nothing's changing for a process at equilibrium. So that is a discussion of entropy, a, discussion, a brief discussion of the second law of thermodynamics, which I will get to in much greater detail in the next video presentation. So look uh, for some suggested problems uh, associated with this video for the QOD. And thanks for watching.